Welcome everyone to the Real Estate Wealth Lab. We've got a special guest here tonight and I'm going to introduce him in just a moment. Um, so thank you. It's so great to see you, Anita. I've already said hello to Doug and Ron and um, Brian. I see you're on there and Duncan. Oh, you guys, I'm so excited. I hope you guys get on camera. I know we've got to connect. So at any rate, um, so there's lots of great folks who are joining us today and we are also live streaming this. So just as a heads up, um, I'm going to share my screen right now and walk us through just a little bit about what the Real Estate Wealth Lab is and then we're going to get right into our very special guest today. So I'm just going to share my screen and here we are at our Market Leaders Lab event and today we will be having AJ Hazzy. Um, from the, the founder of Vantage West Realty. He's joining us and we are going to be talking about some very cool ways to do real estate. Very excited to have him on and we will get to a proper introduction in just a moment. So a little bit about, oops, well, one moment please. Let's try that again. Um, one moment. Oh, that was the end of the slideshow, I guess. My apologies, everyone. Sometimes operator errors happen. So now you should be seeing almost, you'd think I'd never done this before. <laughs> All right, let's try again. Now, can you see my screen? Thank you. And let's just make sure I'm not on the last slide. There we are. Okay, so the Real Estate Wealth Lab is here for you to take your real estate portfolio to the next level at whatever stage you are, whether you're starting out, whether you're scaling into something bigger, or even whether you're seceding. Um, in other words, looking for that succession plan or to exit. So what is Rule? We've got a laboratory of specialists that we focus on real estate research, data analysis, what to do and when. <laughs> so we keep you on top of that. And we've got some great artificial intelligence and real estate um, digital components in our amazing tech team uh, uh, working on our proprietary analysis formula in the background. And really all of this combined lets us take the guesswork, yep, and the uncertainty out of real estate so that we can deliver actionable and personalized in, um, investment intelligence directly to you based on where you are in your real estate career. Again, whether you're just starting, scaling, or seceding and getting you that uh, personalized action plan. So our team, our team rules. We've got a really cool team. Um, so I'm Jennifer Hunt. I am the chief intelligence officer. And that basically means that yes, I'm a geek and uh, I like to do research and we're a research team for you. And uh, that's, uh, that's really my area of expertise. We have Richard Dolan, he's our chief growth officer. Naran, he also cannot make it here tonight, our chief leadership officer. Uh, Ken Klinipakis, chief operating officer. I know he's jumping on in just a little bit. Vincent Sundar, chief technology officer. Giveaway, right on, I know you're here. Yan, our chief marketing officer. Rob, our chief real estate strategist. And Paige, giveaway Paige. She is our head of customer experience. So we've got a great team. And in fact, you can follow us on Instagram. Each one of us has a very different uh, perspective in terms of what's um, uh, area of expertise. So for example, Vincent's going to be posting about all things real estate, but also property technology, prop tech, and all these digital things out there in the world. I'll be in, doing a little bit more on the research side. Um, and of course, Naran on more leadership and coaching and getting the support that you need from that perspective. So that's, uh, take a, yeah, take a picture of that if you like. And that way we can stay in touch, follow us on those handles. And what you get with Rule. So this is just a really short snippet. I'm not even gonna take more than 10 minutes because um, we've got to get into our amazing, amazing event tonight. However, I just wanted to let you know that you do get weekly reports and not even just one weekly report, there's multiple weekly reports of intelligence. One of them, for example, is our intelligence newsletter. Um, we've got expert commentary. We look at macro trends. We look at micro trends. We look at economic trends and demographic trends, all in how it affects you and your real estate. Um, we've got regular live digital events, such as the one you're attending right now. So thank you for joining us. And we also provide city specific market analysis and masterminds who here pop it in the chat do you want to get to know other individuals and build a community in real estate you want to mastermind 
Oh, good. Okay. Yes, we've got a yes, a resounding in all caps. Yes. And for sure, right on. Exactly. So what we've heard from our, our amazing community is that people want to connect with each other. They want deal flow. They want to be with like-minded individuals who are understanding um, how, oh, awesome. Natalia, great to see you. Yes, exactly. Doug. So amazing that we can connect and really build that community so that we can be masterminds in our world. Of, of our portfolio, either uh, starting, scaling, or succeeding. So, all right. So a couple of other things about um, the rule portal and products. So in addition to all of those other things, we've got an amazing portal in the background that serves you and we are able to show you, these are kind of some of the, the at your fingertips, you log in, you can have access to all of the videos and the presentations that we've done 24 seven, they're all recorded. Like this one is being recorded right now. Um, you can access our incredible lab of calculators. Now, I know some of you are saying like, hey, I don't need another real estate calculator. I've got a spreadsheet for that. I've already been doing this for a long time. And I know many of you are that way, um, <clears throat> as am I. I love my, my spreadsheets for sure. However, sometimes I was finding that my spreadsheets when I'm showing them to join venture partners, Mm, it wasn't so effective. So these are great tools that you can plug in your numbers, do your analysis, plug in your numbers, and then have it create um, a beautiful, beautiful report that's really something you could be proud of sharing with a joint venture partner. And that, is that good or good? I think that's really good. So, and then you've got um, also your real estate intelligence and uh, with your, with the news articles and studies and like what they mean. Um, and your uh, analysis. But then in addition to that, here's some of these calculators that I was talking about. Fast filter, Airbnb, in other words, short term vacation rentals. Is that something that could work for your property? Well, don't don't guess. Definitely don't guess. So in addition to market research, where you look at zoning and things like that, you'll want to look at the actual Airbnb calculator. So as you can see, there's a ton of them. The Deal Dicer is an incredible tool. If you haven't gone in there, if you're a member and you haven't gone in there and checked that out yet, please do start it right away because it's a really cool, I believe in win-win. Who here does not believe in win-win? Because <laughs> that's just not on. We're all about win-win, and that includes in our real estate deals. And so as a result, we created a calculator so that you can always make sure that it's a win-win and show your potential partner why it's a win-win the way you've diced that deal. So again, tons of different calculators available for you. And there's, yeah, deal analyzer, fractionalizer. I mean, like everything has a path and it's really set up um, very intuitively in the member portal. And save the dates. Come and hang out with us on our, on the reg on the regular Wednesdays. So we have every pretty much most Wednesdays. So every second, third and fourth Wednesday of the month, we have either a market leaders lab. I'll get into that in a moment. We have something where we're connecting as a community, learning, expanding, masterminding, uh, open Q and A's, you name it, networking, those types of things. So here's what they look like. Welcome everyone. You are currently on the second Wednesday of the month and this is our market leaders lab. At our Market Leaders Lab, we typically host an individual who has had great success in real estate, even if it might not appear that way right off the bat. So for example, in January, we had David Falk, uh, Michael Jordan, you guys know Michael Jordan, yeah, <laughs> some pretty big, pretty big names out there, his sport agent. Now you might be wondering, why would you have a sport agent on your Market Leaders Lab? What's the connection? Jennifer, please. Well, it's because he actually is a very significant player in real estate. What we found is that individuals with money, uh, they like to preserve their money and grow their money in real estate. So we're always looking for individuals and, and interviewing them so that we can follow success and follow smart money as they say. So we learned some great tools. Thank you, David, for coming on the show and letting us know those if you're listening out there. And then, um, and today, that's where we are. We've got AJ Hazzy, and I'll introduce him in just a moment. And then our community lab is the third Wednesday of the month. Well, what's a community lab? This is where we actually, um, it, it depends. Sometimes we do some pretty deep networking, uh, sometimes some fast networking, getting to know one another. Oh, hey, Zoria, good to see you again. That's fantastic. Haven't seen you in a little bit. 
Um, so we get to hang out with each other and get to know exactly just what I like say hi <laughs> and get to uh, to really, really connect and to start to move deals. So actually next community lab, uh, you'll want to mark this on your calendar is that we're actually going to have AJ back and he is going to show us a little bit of his presentation and then we are going to pepper him with questions. This will be a full on, oh, but yeah, he's, he's doing the come on, bring it on. Um, absolutely. And then it will be completely open for him. You'll be able to, um, yeah, actually ask your question. Of course, you can type it in the chat if you're if you're shy. And I encourage you to do that today as well. Um, but next week, it will be full on for open questions and connecting with one another. And then on the fourth Wednesday of the month, we have what's called our research lab. And that is where we provide um, macro uh, economic views, politics, policies, economic, leading economic indicators that are impacting our real estate, both in Canada and the USA. Now, this is really important because I don't know any other organization that's doing both. It's south of the north of the north and south of the border. And then we dive into um, a particular state or province and a couple of cities for city market analysis at each one of those events. So there's lots going on there. Um, oops, pardon me. And <laughs> there we are. Sorry, I went too fast. So why do you want to join our free trial? Wait, wait, let's slow down. First, join as a member and you can have all of those benefits. However, if you're wanting to test us out and see what we're all about, we do have for a limited time only a free trial. And so this free trial, um, you actually get to explore and experience all that Rule has to offer. You're automatically registered to all of our events. You have access to our portal and to our service team. We've got some pretty experienced uh, folks in our in our group here, as you saw, the, of our team. And you're going to receive the weekly intelligence newsletter, among all the other experiences that we just sort of went through. So I encourage you. It is a 30-day free trial. It's for a limited time only. Paige, you're amazing. Paige just popped it in the chat of how to register for that. Um, realestatewealthlab.com forward slash trial. So we'd love to have you along. And for those of you who are members already, thank you for being here. We love you. And we invite you to become a Rule Ambassador. Share with others what we're up to and how they can participate. And guess what? You can become, um, you can get money. How's that? <laughs> By joining our free referral program, uh, you're actually able to you get, uh, there's a certain process on how that all comes together, but then you get a 10% credit towards your membership or products at Rule. Um, by, uh, by sharing it with others and having them come along. Catherine from Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. By the way, thank you for that, Catherine. We are international. Like I said, we're one of the few that's Canada and the US, and we have folks from around the world because it's important to understand uh, our portfolios in that macro global context. So here you are, here's uh, all of our information, realestatewealthlab.com. You can follow us on all of the various socials, medias. Um, on Instagram, by the way, we're the Real Estate uh, Wealth Lab. So keep that in mind. And ladies and gentlemen, let's get into our program right now. So I'd like to introduce AJ Hazzy, um, founder of Vantage West Realty. And um, we've, AJ and I have known each other for quite some time. Um, so I'm going to, <laughs> if I think probably like at least six or seven years now, I would say. And we're both from Kelowna, British Columbia. We actually, I think, went to the same high school. But anyway, put all that aside. <laughs> um, we've known each other for a long time. AJ is an incredible, incredible investor. He's been investing for over 20 years. Uh, he's got an incredible reputation for doing the right thing, helping clients out very effectively. Um, and today he's going to be talking to us about this cash offer. And we're going to go, it's completely innovative. It's super cool. And I'm going to stop the screen share so that you can see both of us. And we're just going to have a conversation about it. And AJ, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love for you to share a little bit more about your story so that you're doing a proper introduction uh, to all of our guests here today. And you're new, yeah. so I'm gonna, there you go. Perfect. Right Welcome, on. AJ. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, we have known each other for a while, and it's good to see you. It's good to be 
back in uh, in front of your uh, your gang again. Um, you wanted to know about my story? Uh, geez, yeah. where do we start? I've been uh, in the real estate business now for a little over 20 years, and uh, I've sort of vertically integrated myself through the whole gamut. I have a real estate company called Vantage West Realty, which is a group of about 55 individuals that uh, do a great job in the resale uh, market. We've got a property management company that manages a little over 700 doors, and we have a construction arm real estate development arms, and now we have the investment fund as well with Cash Offer LP. So all things real estate, I love it. Um, yeah, it's just my favorite asset class because we can um, force appreciation. We can, uh, you know, ride the hedge against inflation. It's just a, it's been a wonderful gift. So I'm excited well, to talk about it tonight. Thank you, AJ. And for those of you who are taking notes and who are going to be joining us next week too, when we have more time to go in to pepper you with even more questions, just take note of property management firm, brokerage, uh, actually a you know, realtor as well, and an investor. So these are all amazing hats that we can tap into the your expertise. Hey, AJ? You bet. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So for those of you listening today, um, I'd like you to consider what we're talking about from a couple of different hats. So some of you who I know are really like cranking it out there. Um, but I'm going to start with actually those who are not. So for those of you who are just getting started, let's say you this is, you know, really, you're just kind of curious about real estate. You don't really know what's going on. That is perfect. And I want you to consider it from, are you starting out? Are you scaling your business or are you succeeding? In other words, are you getting in an exit, a succession plan? And as we look at today, if you're just starting out, you may not want to do this yourself. You may be listening to AJ and go, hmm, I'm evaluating where I might put potentially some of my resources or capital and whatever in investments into an evaluating a, a particular product and evaluating the individual who's running that product. And so I want you to listen to it from a don't do it yourself perspective. In that case, you may not want to be setting this up. But for those of you who are further along, and I know there's some of you who've got some pretty sizable portfolios on this call, I'm not going to name you. Don't worry, I'll keep that confidential. That's for you to disclose. Um, but you may be wanting to consider scaling and doing something with your portfolio or doing something different or having another tool in your toolkit. And the cash offer is one of those that you may want to model. So you may want to consider do it yourself and you can tap into AJ and learn exactly exactly what it's like to set it up and to do it and do it yourself. So those are the two ways I would like you to consider listening to, do, to get to get the most value out of today's uh, today's call. So fantastic and welcome Austin. That's awesome. Okay, so I think we need to take a few minutes, AJ, maybe like five to five ish, if we could about. So first of all, what is cash offer? Just give us an overview so that we can dive into some questions. Yeah, so it's a limited partnership for sophisticated real estate investors, accredited investors to uh, come together and take advantage of the best strategies that are working in any given market. We have one sort of main strategy that we've been using, which is combining an, inst an instant offer, which is where the name cash offer came from, because that's sort of our public facing name. We have a website called cashoffer.ca, which offers people who want to sell their home quickly an, an opportunity to sell their homes. It's a, it's a variation of that. We buy homes fast for cash that you see everywhere. Um, so the I buying space is huge in the United States. And I saw that happening four or five years ago when I, cause I spent my time in, in Phoenix over the winters. And it's huge in Phoenix. And so I thought this is a great idea for a real estate company to be able to offer this versus it being a third party. So that's where the name Cash Offer came from. But what Cash Offer LP is essentially is a fund where me as the general partner, I find distressed sale properties and we take them, we use my construction company to get them up to their highest and best uh, use and maximize the value. And then we marry that strategy with one that I've been doing for over 10 years, which is the rent to own strategy. So the way that we sell the properties is on a longer time horizon and we get a nice premium as well as we get a fabulous tenant with skin in the game along the way. So that's that's what cash offer is, is to execute those two strategies in, in combination, as well as there is a percentage of the portfolio that we do more speculative things with. We, uh, we built a, a spec home recently and sold it, made a wonderful profit on it. We are doing some land assemblies that will flip to, do it, to developers 
as well. So looking to create these uh, nice little capital gain events that happen along the way too. But our mainstay strategy is that uh, one that I described. Right on. Okay. So you sort of mentioned a little bit of what inspired it in terms of your time in Phoenix and seeing that. Um, is there anything else that really brought this to, to light for you and inspired the concept? Because like yeah. you said, it's very innovative to have a real estate company doing the cash offer component and then marrying it with the strategy of rent to own. So yeah, I mean, because I have a real estate company, my deal flow is very good. And so I've got a reputation for being someone who had a nose for a deal. And I often had um, opportunities to buy things that were below market value. And always my eyes are bigger than my stomach. So as a consequence, I would have joint ventures with clients because my clients would become my friends. And, and uh, you know, they would say, hey, if you ever see a great deal and you want to go partners, let me know. And so at one point, if I think back to like 20. 14, 15, 16, I had like seven or eight different joint venture partners on different projects. And it was getting a little bit uh, challenging to manage. It was confusing. And uh, what I thought to myself was, and the other issue with it was certain clients would see what I was doing with someone else and have FOMO, right? They would say, oh, how come I didn't see that? FOMO deal? is fear of missing out in case yeah. you didn't know Thanks. FOMO. <laughs> So that was another issue, right? Was like, hey, why didn't I hear about that deal? So I was like, you know what I need to be able to do is I need to, I need a, a syndicated partnership where everybody gets a piece of every deal. That way we spread the risk and there's no more, how come I didn't hear about that one? Everybody's part of it. So and really, Aiden, this is just months. about you keeping your friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Sorry, go on. No, I was uh, just clearing my throat. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, well, and I love that you said that you've got an, a nose for getting a deal. So that's fantastic because I was just imagining you in the Okanagan, there's all the vineyards and the wineries. And I'm like, well, this is the new sommelier. Like, don't we all just want to have like a nose for great deals? So that's fantastic of you marrying all of those pieces and uh, really creating win-win, which is something that I value and that we at the Real Estate Love Lab value a great deal. So, um, I guess we should probably start at the beginning in terms of how you started it. So this is kind of like, you know, your thought process around why you would start it, but let's get into some details. How did you actually go about it? Sure. So, I mean, the structure, that's the boring part. I figured out, okay, what is this? Is this a corporation or is it a limited partnership? And after some consult with my lawyer and my accountant, we determined that a limited partnership or an LP was the, the right structure or vehicle to do this. And uh, obviously then you have to build out the agreements and all of that. Once that was done, I had to figure out, well, what was my strategy? You know, what was the unique value proposition that we had? So I came up with this marriage between, you know, buy low and sell on the red zone. So when I felt like I had a pretty succinct, something different, you know, a reason why people should pay attention, then I, uh, I just sent out an email to, you know, people that were close in my database, friends, family members, good past clients, you know, previous joint venture partners. And I invited them to my house and I just uh, served a little wine, did a little appetizers and then uh, said, okay, it's time for the presentation. And I threw my 30 minute slide deck on similar to the one that you guys will see here uh, next Wednesday. And uh, I shared what I was up to and I just said, Hey, I'd love to get you guys part of it. And the minimum buy-in at that time was 150 K. And so it was, uh, you know, it was a big, it was a tall order considering it was unproven. Right. And uh, surprisingly, we were able to raise a couple million bucks that night. And uh, so man, that's a my... testament, by the way, I just want to have if, I'm sure many of you have tried, you know, having folks over your family and friends and done a pitch deck in front of them and raising a million dollars in a night or a couple million or whatever is definitely a, a, a feat in and of itself. So kudos to you, AJ. Thanks. Yeah, I am. Um... I was uh, I was overwhelmed by the, the support. It was uh, it was really cool to see, and I realized, okay, I must have something here. And uh, obviously, I wanted to give everyone a leveraged return. So now I had to figure out how to lever their money. And of course, with a limited partnership, they're not going on any of the debt. So then I spent the next, I think it took me about three months of being turned down by all the mainstream banks. I finally found a credit union that was willing to essentially create a new product for me, which was a non-recourse commercially adjudicated residential mortgage. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, can you say that five times fast? Wow, uh, and they created a new product for you. They did, yeah. And so obviously it had to go through all the channels and they, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people had to A-OK -okay that. And uh, obviously I had to um, 
bless it with my, you know, the rest of my personal covenant, of course. <laughs> I'm pretty sure um, a personal guarantee happened there. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a large PG there. But yeah, and then over time, as we've gone, we've, we, we worked out what the parameters were so that we could have one giant line of credit that we were able to give four to one leverage to the investor capital at a low interest rate. And so once we had that, then it was like, okay, we've got something, we've got some real purchasing power because, you know, that $2 million raise was able to give us, you know, seven, $8 million purchasing power. So that got mm -hmm. us off to the races and we just started buying. And you just started buying. Okay. So that question there with, that we just went through was a bit more of the do it yourself. Like if you're considering doing this yourself, the, that's how one would start <laughs> friends and family pitch deck etc cetera, etc cetera. but now you're talking about buying so i want to go into a little bit more of that okay what what do you look for when you start buying so what are the key elements of diligence that you're looking for with cash offer sure so obviously being a real estate agent i'm no stranger to evaluating properties so i have a pretty good methodology when it comes to figuring out what something's worth. So the first criteria for us was, are we buying it at at least 10% below market value? That was criteria to, criteria number one. And so what I did with cashoffer.ca was I did a press release in Kelowna and it said, hey, there's a new instant offer available. And there was a lot of people that went to the website to check it out and a lot of people requested an offer. And uh, so we started you know, sending out offers right away. and. Uh, we had a half a dozen people say, yeah, we'll, we'll look at that deal. So then I'm like, okay, so that's actually more than I actually have the cash to do right now. So now I have to get really serious about picking out the best deals. So we figured out what our buy box was and we, we wanted to um, go with something that we knew would be really marketable on the rent to own side. And so we ended up buying one of those brand new fourplexes, you know, on the infill lot. So our first purchase was a, was a fourplex that was you know, appraised at around 2 million and we bought it for 1.75. So it was a pretty good, uh, it was a little better than the 10% discount that we were looking for. And then we put rent to own deals in place and exited that property for 2.4 a, a year and a half to two years later. So it was a, wow. it, was a it was a win for sure. Um, but the due diligence side of it for us was obviously making sure we're under value. We've got a great home inspector. You know, we had to make sure that we're not buying something that's going to give us a ton of problems. So if the major systems of the property are, are shot, then it's accounted for in the pricing. We will readjust our offer and then, um, you know, utilize our contractors to go in there and, and uh, get the place up to snuff. I want to um, just draw us back a little bit to something you said about, so in the market and you're in, you know, you're doing your diligence because you know the market. So let's, let's just talk about Kelowna, British Columbia, for example. And and you said you started this, what, a couple of years ago? Yeah, we're in our third year. We're almost third year. third year. Yeah. That's right. So even three years ago, for those of you who don't know, the Kelowna, British Columbia was a, is, was a hot market and has been uh, on the rise for quite some time. Would you say, AJ, like pretty much it's been a hot market for a long time. It's in an expansionary period, a prolonged expansionary period, I would call it. Yeah, so our market has been like insane since COVID. And previous to that, um, from 2018 to 2020, it was kind of like a flat market. It was good, but not amazing. Yeah. And then from 2016 to 2018, we were going gangbusters. Yeah. So it was that. So it has been, we've been in an up cycle for a, a good period of time. Yeah, fair enough. So this is why I wanted to draw our attention to this because even in a very hot market, I heard you were able to secure deals 10% mm -hmm. under a minimum 10% mm -hmm. under the market value. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's important that this, this type of strategy, this tactic, if you will, can actually work in any market. You just have to know how to, how to do it. So I know that we did at our research lab last week, um, we did a market analysis of Phoenix, Arizona and that area and that area actually phoenix and Kelowna, their markets are very kind of in lockstep in some ways they're both going shooting through the roof right now so it is if you're considering that market for example in the u.s um aj would this type of strategy that you're talking about work in the u.s absolutely i'm yeah. i'm here in scottsdale right now and meeting with uh kind of the, the we buy homes team on a oh. weekly and we're we're putting together a, a very similar offer here Oh, right on. Okay. Well, there yeah. you go. So perfect. Uh, it works on both sides of the borders. That's important to our, to our, all of our audience. 
So then when you do your diligence, um, you're, you've got certain areas that you're looking for. And like you say, you're also looking in other to expand into other areas. What kind of assets specifically? Because you said a fourplex. So what kind of assets is it that you're, that you're looking at primarily? So I like a bit of a mix. Um, the single family homes tend to be what you see the most of when it comes to an instant offer. But that being said, there's uh, certainly opportunity in the multifamily space as well. And those are dual assets, in my opinion. Like most of my personal portfolio, I had transitioned from single families and duplexes over to apartment buildings over the last decade or so. So when we see opportunities for something like that, that's um, now having said that part of our portfolio with cash offer LP is buying land and land banking that that can do purpose built rentals. So larger, you know, 60 plus unit purpose built rentals. We've secured two sites to do that. So we, that is like the crown jewel asset in my opinion, <laughs> yes. but there's a lot of money to be made on the single family and the residential stuff for the fact that it's easy to, easy to move in and out of those, right? You can buy them, you can fix them up. If you know what you're doing, you can exit them very safely. They're not something that uh, you have to wait for a particular you know, institutional buyer or something to help you out of it. So it's very liquid. It's a much more liquid asset. Which more is nice liquid, for, yeah. So for moving in and out quickly, which is what we're doing in some cases, then those, uh, those assets work really well. Okay. Um, and you, so you're choosing based on a kind of a wide variety. It sounds like a mix in terms of, you know, land development, but primarily sort of where the major ones are single family, like in terms of actually, so another criteria that you use because it's instant offer, as I recall you saying what a definition of distressed is, and I think that this is important. Um, so I'm going to just come in here a little bit more with you because that's one of the criteria that you're looking for is that under market value typically has some form of distress. And what I've seen out there in the world of real estate investors is that when they think of distressed, the immediate thing that comes to mind is a house that's sort of falling down as it's in repair. And it's the distress about the actual property. But AJ, you and I have talked about this plenty of times. So I'll let you have, I'll let you have the stage here. Tell us about distressed. Sure. I mean, distress is really, you know, an exaggerated or maybe dramatic way of saying urgency or motivation. And motivation comes from all different things. I mean, there's the big D's, there's, you know, drugs, divorce, deferred maintenance. You know, those are the ones that you see often. But there's also times where people just need their money now. And it's a matter of convenience. Or they've got tenants in a property that are being really difficult. I had, we, we acquired one property. The tenants were being such a nightmare that just for taking them off of the owner's hand, we got a deep discount on the property. Um, we had another one who, uh, he, he had built the property for his son and his son um, fell on hard times and had some addiction issues. And the place was just, it could never be lifted and shown. It just, it was the type of property could not be sold and with his son in there and all of his friends sort of doing what they were doing, it would be not possible to, to lift it. So it's circumstantial sometimes. It's not always necessarily uh, specific to deferred, you know, to the place being dilapidated. It's just often, another example, I would have been my own customer a couple of years ago. There was an opportunity to get in on a, uh, on a limited partnership similar to what I have. And it was a half million dollar minimum and I didn't have the, the dry powder to do it. And I had a duplex that I was thinking it was time to sell, but I had difficult tenants in it. It wasn't, I wouldn't be able to get it to market. I had only a couple of weeks to get the money to get into this. They were going to close. Once this thing was subscribed, there was right. done. And so for me to leave 10% on the table, but to have the instantaneous cash to be able to go into a new asset, especially after I had made my money on that duplex, as far as I felt, right. leaving 10% on the table, not paying any real estate commissions, getting my money in a week, that, that made sense in that moment. You right? know, I so love there are people who you see share that. that, AJ, because to your point, no one would ever think that, you know, with your success in real estate, like, oh, you, you'd be your own client distressed. No, you're right. Like, it could be, oh, I just need access to this capital. I've made plenty on it, but I can't get the equity and, and get it out as fast as I need in order to, uh, you know, repatriate your capital in another, in another deal. That, very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Hmm. You bet. Okay, um, so then what decision factors do you actually look at when you're, um, when you're buying a cash offer? So what is it that you're like, what kind of 
what what decisions go into it so you've said sort of sort of under undervalue all mm-hmm. those distressed and things like that what else so got to be buying it at a margin of safety for sure need to be able to add value so i'm looking for low-hanging fruit where i can add value um it's not to say that every property i'm going to do a major overhaul on it but i want to be able to go in there at least grab the low-hanging fruit mm-hmm. and give myself an instant bump on the value so that's a one of the big criteria and then it has to be something that I can see myself either wanting to hold a long time, like a multifamily property, or a property that I know is going to be attractive to someone who is going to be our end user, our, our rent to own client that we're going to empower and help them, you know, finally get their foot on the property ladder. So there's certain properties that don't lend themselves well to a rent to own scenario, you know, some luxury properties and outlier, you know, outliers, recreational stuff. That's not really what we're looking for. We're looking for family homes, more of the bread and butter stuff. Right. Actually, this is a good point. We kind of stepped over that earlier that maybe there's an opportunity for you to just take a moment and explain um, what rent to own is for those of you who are listening, you know, out there and just getting started and you're wondering, okay, so you get a property under price and then you put in a rent to own what? So maybe I apologize if I didn't catch that earlier. Um, I've, I've been around a long time too, so <laughs> my bad. So if you want to ex- describe what what that looks like a little, a little bit more detail, because you said yeah. empowering AJ, and that's an important win-win component of rent to own. Sure. I'll, I'll even start at the beginning. So why I got in the rent to, rent to own business was I came after the global financial crisis, we had all of these listings and they weren't selling. And it got to the point where the owner said, I'm just going to have to rent it. Now I was aware of rent to own at that time, thankfully. And so I was able to step in actually as the option E, which is the person entering into the rent to own deal. And I said, look, I'll take an option on your house for the list price. And I'll take I'll, I'll take a two year um, a two year lease agreement, and you don't have to worry about maintenance anymore. Because that's the nice thing about rent to own is that they act as owners and get the true experience of ownership. Which means if the toilet starts to leak or the <laughs> furnace runs out, it's it's there it's on them. It's on their dollar. And it's their time. They don't call you. They don't have a landlord to call. Got to learn to and change so, that flapper. <laughs> so it's just like home ownership, right? And so you give them the the real the real experience. And so that is how I got into rent own and I was able to then do what's called sandwich leasing to exit those properties and find other rent own people that would take over those contracts. And so I found there was a huge market for people who had uh, had to go a different route than conventional financing. The banks would say no to them. And these are great, wonderful people who just need a little hand up for a multitude of reasons. Maybe they had a credit blemish or perhaps there a lot. This is a big one. Business for self. So they've left a, a career job where they had, a, you know, they were a salaried employee. Banks love salaries, don't love, you know, commission income. They don't love business for self unless you've got two, three year track record. So a lot of these folks, particularly resource workers in oil and gas were making big money, but, you know, it made sense for them to go out on their own and become a contractor. But the minute they did that, they weren't financed for it. So these were the types of people that I was working with, putting them into these properties so they could get their family situated. So. What a rent-to-own deal is, is either a seller or someone who's doing sandwich leasing would create an opportunity for someone to be able to put a small amount of cash down, and that can range depending on how you want to structure your deal, and then you agree on a purchase price. We use a 3.5% per year rate of appreciation that's pre-agreed to, and so if they do a three-year deal, it ends up being about 11%, 11 to 11.5% based on the compounding nature of it. And so- And that's in Colonos market, primarily? Yeah, and that's, a, I mean, that's a, that would work. I mean, that's well below the yeah. appreciation rate that we've seen, like that's below the, the 15 year average or the 20 year average, which is over 5%. So when you're saying to them, you're saying, look, this is still a great opportunity. I'm not looking to grab all of the gains. And if it goes parabolic, that's all of yours to gain. So they still stand, they still have a nice hedge against inflation and they have an option to not move forward as well. And they have an option to extend. If the market value isn't there, they can extend the deal. So it's it's got a lot of optionality to it, which mm-hmm. makes it a, a nice deal for uh, for people looking to get into the market. As an investor, when the market does turn, um, I would turn your attention to that as a strategy to acquire property because you can uh, you can get your name on a lot of property for very low outlay. Yeah, it works both ways. Yeah, 
Okay, thank you. So for those of you who are listening now, you know but more of rent to own. <laughs> I see Anita's happy about that. Okay, great. Sorry. So then having that come and join in with a distressed property, and then you can kind of start to see that whole sort of package come together and making cash offer this concept a very, very unique uh, model out in the marketplace. And I love this. There's so many innovative ways to do real estate. Um, it's fantastic. So um, AJ, if people are considering um, coming into cash offer, what would you recommend that they do coming in, being a client, get, participating with you? What would you recommend in terms of diligence that they do when buying cash offer? Sure. Well, I mean, anytime you're looking at a deal, you want to see the financials, of course, and, uh, you know, do your due diligence on the general partner, you know, make sure they've got skin in the game, make sure that, you know, the finance financials are good, make sure that reputationally that you're, you're happy with the sound reputation, talk to some of the investors if they're willing to, if the general partner is willing to let you. And certainly I'm an open book, you know, we're, we're very transparent. If you want to see, um, if you want to chat with a handful of our investors, more than happy to. We make all of our payments on time and we've got a you know a big stable of happy investors so i would have no trouble connecting with connecting you to any of them but uh, we do also have our, our uh, funds listed on front funder so i don't know if you're familiar with that but um we're I on am, there but yeah. others might not be so please feel free to explain yeah. what that is oh, yeah. so front, front funder is an online exempt market dealer emd and they have fully vetted and done the due diligence on our deal because they will only put deals on their platforms that have made it through their rigorous due diligence process. They've got in-house lawyers and accountants and everything. So we've kind of gone through a full auditing process with them and then they introduce us to their clientele. So a number of our investors have come by way of that portal, but all of our financials, all of the uh, documentation, the partnership document, everything is all there in a data room for people to grab. So again, full transparency as well. Right on. Um Okay, and then how about in terms of you taking and like, are you participating yourself in these deals? Like, is that important at all in any way, shape, or form of knowing that? I mean, you mentioned skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So, does, does the amount matter? How? What would we look at? Well, what you want to see is what does the general partner do with his GP split? I think so. For me, I roll a hundred percent of my GP split back into the fund, and I continue to grow my position in my own fund. So I'm eating, eating my own cooking. I'm not taking my percentage <laughs> and going and doing something else with it. When I take my RRSPs, we've made our made ours RRSP eligible. When I get my when I do my RRSP contribution at the end of the year, I invest it in my own fund. Eating right? your own cooking, I love it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's important. So like even if you're considering, ladies and gentlemen, as a do it yourself, these are the kinds of things that people would be evaluating you, like your track record, how much you're involved. Are you going to be continuing to be involved and in rolling it in like a in some ways a drip, if you will, but like continuously um, putting in your own money uh, in your and your portion and having yeah just having like a, a a good portfolio and I love that you mentioned testimonials if you will or at least references and connecting with others so from if you're thinking of doing something like this yourself those are pieces that you'll want to make sure that you're starting to to prepare for so that you can answer those questions too and then for those of you who are evaluating these kinds of deals whether it's this one or others those are also what you need to be thinking about so uh, so AJ then we'll switch it a little bit so who's your ideal client ideal client I uh, I tend to attract a lot of dentists doctors these guys that uh, they want to do what they do and they want to park their cash with someone who knows how to do what they do. So I tend to attract a lot of that. I, I would say that's my ideal client, but that tends to be who we have a lot of in terms of our partners. But uh, I like people who have seen the other side as well. So who are experienced real estate investors, because you know how much work is involved in buying a home and finding the deal and then doing the due diligence on it and then managing it and managing the renovation and managing the finance and getting the place financed and managing the appraisals and, all, and the insurance and all those things that come with it. And so you have a sense of how much work there is. And you know that when you're making money, when you're doing DIYing it, you know that it's not passive income. It is very much active income. Okay. And so the minute 
you hand your money over to someone like myself and you step into the investor role and you see me running around with like a chicken with <laughs> my head what? cut off. <laughs> I think I want to do it just for that, AJ. That's awesome. Great. That's where you, because there's no sweet without the sour, right? That you have to have tasted the other side to truly understand how good a deal it is to have someone like me with my experience going a hundred miles an hour on your behalf. And it is purely an armchair investment. So I find that the people who come to me after having sold a fourplex, you know, a small portfolio and say, Oh man, this is so much better. I mean, I've got one client Barrett and he uh, liquidated a number of properties and he put over a million bucks with me. And, you know, he's, he, he gets a, you know, he's got a nice six figure passive income. He doesn't work anymore. And he's just like, this is the best thing ever instead of going by and checking on my properties. Cause he was quite anal too. Like if there was rubbish on the front yard, it would just drive him nuts. So he's like, this, this property ownership thing is really doing my head in because I can't stand to see how these tenants treat my properties. So, I mean, he's, he's an, he would be my ideal client if I could duplicate Baron. Well, and I, and I love that because that's exactly why at the real estate wealth lab, we've been really characterizing um, you know, where we are, of course, all, all when they're, you know, getting into next level investors, but it's this concept of, you know, where are we actually? And, you know, I think everyone needs to be aware of real estate and the benefits of real estate and be educated on the market and, you know, what's going on so that they can ask right questions. But it is not for everyone, to your point. Like, it is a lot of work and there's a lot going on and all the things to be compliant and making sure that you're above board and all of that. And uh, so I think it's really cool. People should get like a nice grounding in real estate, some education, some research, etc. And then in many cases, it's like, yeah, keep your day job and do your thing and then invest over here with a professional and an expert such as yourself, AJ. So very, very cool. Um, and I know we've talked a lot about sort of some of how cash offer kind of came to be and whatnot, but I'd like to talk about how cash offer is um, it's better than the competition. So this is an opportunity for you to toot, toot your own horn, I guess. And, you know, how, what are the benefits? What are the competitive advantages of cash offer? Well, thanks for teeing me up for my own infomercial here. I don't want to make it sound salesy at all. I really want this to be educational for everyone, but I will share with you why I like this strategy and you can DIY it as well. The strategy we're using is very conservative in the sense that you're downside protected. We know that we're, we're at the tail end, I think, of a boom in many market centers. Not ever, no, obviously you can't paint you know, all of the uh, North American market with the same brush. But in terms of where we are in the cycle, I feel like we're in the third trimester, at least for Kelowna. And so you have to be mindful of what comes next and you have to have some thought around downside. So, you know, we talk about why we're better than our competitors. Well, what are your what are your options? Right. So your options would be maybe to put your money in a mortgage investment corporation or it could be to put your money like if you were looking for a, a hands off thing, you know, those are potentially more sensitive to a downturn people falling behind on their payments, et cetera. And then the situation you're in when you're a mortgage lender is that you have to foreclose. And that foreclosure process is very long and it can be very costly and it's very unlikely that there's gonna be enough money to clear the minus at the end of the day. And so in comparison to something like that, I really like what we're doing because we stay on title the entire time. If somebody falls behind in a, in a rent owned deal, we try to work with them for a short amount of time, but if there's no if it doesn't look like they're doing the right things to get back on track, then it's, it's as simple as an eviction process through the tenancy branch. And it's right. very quick. And the nice thing about it is if we do go into a downturn, the bulk, the majority of our um, people, because they have skin in the game as well, they put 30, 40, sometimes a hundred thousand dollars in deposit money down. And a lot of these folks, because they believe they are owners of this property have gone on to improve the property. They've built patios and they've, you know, they've done all kinds of things. So they have a lot of pride of ownership. Made it home. They've made it at home. So now they're not, they don't think of it like a tenant and they don't jump ship just because rental rates go down a little bit. They're in it. And so you've got a deal partner. And if you need to weather the storm with them, mm -hmm. it's a lot better to weather the storm with somebody who's got equity. They've got pride of ownership. And the cash flow that you're getting on them, because that's not going to change when the market changes, is as good as a seven cap piece of real estate. We, we, we've just to give everybody an idea, the way I work the payment, it's essentially like the equivalent of buying a seven cap apartment building, which 
I have not seen in a very long time in the Canadian market. And so. if I may just interject there, because if, and to explain something for those of you not quite so familiar with rent to own, and what you're, what you're ex describing is that when you have a rent to own tenant, yes, they come in and they, they do have pride of ownership, they put in some money for skin in the game, they do take care of all the maintenance, and et cetera, et cetera, and they pay a premium rent. Now, the reason it might sound like, well, that's a lot of money, are you taking advantage of them? No, <laughs> how it works, you've got to work it effectively with that individual. But the reason typically that one would do that is that um, at have a higher rent is that you're actually preparing them, pre-qualifying them for what it would be to uh, have the mortgage when it comes time for them to qualify for the mortgage. Correct, AJ? We model their payment precisely after the true cost of ownership. So I say, okay, you're buying an $800,000 home. You've got 50,000 to put down. And if we finance the 750, your payment would be 4,200 a month. Your property taxes are another 500 a month. The insurance another 200 a month. So your total payment you know, with interest and tax is around five grand a month. Now, if the market value rent for that home is only $4,000 a month, then what we do is we do the differential they get as credit towards the purchase price in the end. So it's not throw away money for them, but they're paying the true cost of ownership and the difference between whatever market value rent is and what they're paying, we give them back against the, against the credit. Of the so they, that sounds awesome. So they're actually kind of building up like a little savings plan, if you will, the practicing the payments and ensuring that they can qualify and hold and maintain the property when it does become theirs. And then that's an added, if I'm hearing this correctly, so correct me if I'm wrong, but then it's also an added benefit to a potential investor of yours, a cash offer, that if the tenant for whatever reason was, the tenant owner, uh, the aspiring owner, uh, is unable to fulfill at the end of the agreement, then you that, that sort of buffer, the savings, doesn't go to them and it goes to the investors to mitigate any losses there. Including their original um, deposit as well, which is typically anywhere from five to 10%. So going back to downside protection, you've got somebody in the home that's paying above market value rent. So your cash flow, you're in a position where you're more than happy to sit in that spot for an extended period of time. So if you have to buckle up for wait for brighter days, like the last time from 2008 to 2016 was that was an eight year period to get back to peak in Kelowna anyway. I know it was a shorter in Vancouver and much shorter in Toronto. It was six months in Vancouver, yeah, but that's like exactly a, why we do market analysis. Yeah. <laughs> for the but we had an eight year run, right? We had an eight, <laughs> yeah. an eight year run. So if that were to happen again, our situation, I wanted to create a strategy that was downside protected. So I would be more than happy to carry these properties for eight years. And at the end of that, we're paying the properties off faster than the tenant buyers are. So our equity is growing, plus we're getting, like I say, that seven cap cash flow, which is makes it easy for me no matter what happens. I can pay my, because uh, I pay an 8% prep rate. So every quarter we do a distribution based on eight, unless we sold something, in which case we divide that, in what we call a waterfall event. But if nothing happened, if nothing got sold, it's 8%. Cool. You just got into super high gear go go mode. So let's step back. So you said an eight percent pref rate. Yep, yep. So let's go back to that. So how does that work with the seven percent cap and then an eight percent um, prefer preferred rate to your investors? Walk us through that just a little bit more slowly, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So as you know, um, because of we're using leverage, the um, cap rate and the actual rate of return on our capital are different, right? So we've got cheap money. So we're able to easily pay out that 8% cash on cash return to the investors with these seven cap properties and even create a surplus again, Perfect. because we're using leverage. And then how, so then let's get into that a little bit. So how often do you provide um, distributions? Quarterly. Quarterly. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Um, anything else about why, Cash offer is uh, has competitive advantages. Well, sure. I mean, we're buying property at a margin of safety. Yeah. We've got deal partners, um, and then of course, we have my entire infrastructure that is all there. So my construction team, which I can control, right? My accounting team. We've got um, my real estate team for that I can crack the whip on and make sure we exit these properties. I can. I have the if I need to make a deal more profitable. I have 
latitude in terms of what I can, I can personally go and sell it for free if I need to, to, to get this thing to hit the target, right? I have, I have more latitude. The construction company, if I, you know, if we need to do something special to make, make deals work, I have all of this extra latitude given where I, my position in all of it, right? And so you're getting, we're not relying on outside uh, interests. We have everybody uh, kind of under one roof. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I really appreciate that. Um, now, so Catherine, I know you've got to go and um, we're only going to do about about five more minutes or so today. And then I want everyone to start thinking about it and then coming back to our community lab next Wednesday when we're going to be taking full on questions. So I want you to be thinking about it again to get the most value for yourself of as a do it yourself you want to do this kind of thing where you're marrying a distressed property or you know an undervalued property with a rent to own how does that look you know all of the benefits that AJ just described he's going to be an open book and tell you how to do it or alternatively if you want to evaluate AJ and his team and the project and whatnot then you're going to have an opportunity to do that more robustly next Wednesday uh, basically, same time, same bat channel. And uh, so that'll be fantastic. So just a couple of more questions. Um, how long has this, you said, so three years for operation in this? You've been in um, real estate for 20 years? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, and then I guess the final question on the cash offer specifically is, we talked a little bit about exits, but how does the, like in terms of, you know, the property and selling it to the rent to own tenant and all of these things, but how does um, an actual investor uh, exit cash offer the LP, sure. the limited yeah. partnership? Yeah, easy peasy. So, you know, we let folks know in the beginning that we hope that they stick with us for a long period of time, but the nature of the types of deals we're doing, there's liquidity events that are happening, you know, every month. So if, a, if an investor says to me, Hey, I'd like to get my my capital out. I've got something else I need to do, or you know, for whatever reason they want to exit. We have had, um, you know, I think, two or three people in the last quarter. I've just wanted to go and take advantage of other opportunities to scale their own business or whatever the case is, and we've uh, provided the return of capital. So that's that's not a problem. There's there's lots of liquidity. There's lots of new investors coming in. As long as I have a little bit of runway, as long as I don't overcommit on the deals we're buying, and then have somebody right at the eleventh hour expecting their cash, that's where that could be a challenge. But if I've got a you know a month, two months in advance notice, then I just earmark that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I see a question, and we're going to have lots of questions next one. Um, investments in Canada or in the states, um, Vincent? These aren't just in Canada at the moment, but um, you're in the states right now in Phoenix, Arizona, looking at potentially expanding yep. there. Correct. Yep. So that's fantastic. Um, so I, I want to whet people's appetites for what what can be possible because I love these questions that are coming in. So at our community lab um, next week for our members, we're going to get into some pretty detailed questions. And so like these are kinds of the things that I want people to be able to have awareness from you. And so what does it take? Like we've heard a little bit about what it takes to set this thing up, but like how much does it cost? <laughs> like how sure. much did it cost you to set this whole structure up in order to create this amazing opportunity for individuals? Yeah, so it depends on whether or not you want to go as far as to file an offering memorandum. So an, an OM is going to cost you probably about $50,000. And then if you want to, and that's to give you access to what they call retail investors. So people who are non-accredited. We've stayed outside of that space uh, currently. So I didn't do an OM. We are accredited investors only. Um, if you want to, like I say, if you want to go wide with this, then spend the money, and that will happen eventually. There's, we've had had to turn down so many people, especially on front funder, who weren't accredited. So I, I think it would be worthwhile doing it. It's, um, but if you're just going to do a limited partnership, you're probably going to be anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand dollars getting that set up. And then if you want to make it TFSA and RRSP eligible, you can work with a, a particular group uh, out of Calgary that I met that uh, will set up a trust scenario for you and I think they charged me ten thousand dollars for that mm -hmm. um, so this is just the paperwork <laughs> this is this is truly the paperwork yeah <laughs> and then um, the biggest hurdle that you're gonna have I mean it's not that cost prohibitive to get in there and create an LP what is challenging is to get the leverage and that's where you're in order to be able to provide double-digit returns to an investor you need cheap money leverage because it's very hard to do it if you're if you're all cash unless you're in a highly appreciating market, but you can't count on that forever. So 
our deal, and just to speak to the last question there, which is like, are you missing out on, on the appreciation? The way we structure these deals is to make sure we've got like 25 to 28% ROI annualized on these deals. So whether or not some of these folks walk into equity because the market went up higher, we're very comfortable with mitigating the risk and structuring the deals so that when they do close, we're in that sort of 20 plus percent range. Not to say we haven't gotten to take advantage of some of the stuff like we did buy property that didn't have rent owned tenants in it, multifamily property, et cetera, which has gone parabolic. And so we've seen our equity grow with the market in some stuff. But our mainstay here is, like I say, I'm trying to balance the risk with the speculative side. Yeah. And I think sorry, that actually answers, here. sorry, that does answer, Darcy, you're asking a couple of questions in there where are rent to owns better than burrs? It's not necessarily better than, it's just different than, I would say. But the missing out on the market appreciation, you're missing out on some. Yep. But you're also sharing or creating a win win, right? If I'm understanding this correctly, cash offer gets some of the appreciation and the rent to own tenant gets some of the appreciation, but you get some added sort of other benefits, especially reducing your downside risk. Well, I'm old school, yes. Okay. Cash flow to me is king. And so the way these deals are structured, they're the best cash flow I've been able to create in any kind of deal bar none. And if you want to weather an economic downturn, cash flow is going to be what's going to matter to you. And so I will forego some opportunity on the appreciation side, even though that's the sexy topic lately when we're making 20, 25% gains. But in a normalized market, and I want to be doing this for the next 30 years, cash flow will be king. And if you if your time horizon is longer, you're going to win with a strategy like this longer term. Certainly in certain parts of the market, there'll be little years where you're going to have that FOMO again of like, oh, I can't believe I sold that to these folks for 200K less than it was worth. That certainly does happen, no question. Referencing the burr, that's why we also go in and try to add value. So one of my one of my criteria is that I need to be able to go in and, and force appreciation. And so that's the same as a, as a burr strategy. We just, um, and we are getting the opportunity to refinance because our uh, revolving line of credit is based on a four to one ratio. So as our equity gains, we have more credit available to us. So we, we get the, we essentially get all the benefits of a burst strategy, but the downside protection of the rent owned, if that makes sense. Awesome. Okay. And Harry's one of our rural members and he's asking rent to own any example of one typical property. Um, and then do you keep a mortgage with bank? And once the rent to own purchaser closes the deal title is a deal closes the deal is a title transferred. So I'll start from the end. When they do close, yes, absolutely. Um, we transfer the title. And the um, mortgages, yeah, we have, like I said, we've got a revolving line of credit with Canadian Western Bank. So they provide us our, our cheap money leverage. And that's at a 75% debt to 25% equity ratio. And um, an example property, we, uh, we just, we're just closing on one right now with a, a property on Knight Road, which uh, I think the, we bought this one for a really good price uh, three years ago. You couldn't buy a house for this price now, but I think we paid 450,000 for it. And uh, they're buying it now um, three years later for I think 525 or something like that. And the property is probably worth seven. <laughs> they're, they're doing wonderful. Uh, but we're gonna make our 26% because the cash flow we made along the way was wonderful. It's a great deal and they're, and they're happy, right? We made them into homeowners. It's a feel Isn't good story. Isn't that amazing? You know, like that just makes me feel warm and fuzzy about the right things to do in real estate and the right things to do in business. You're winning 26% returns are, are they good or good? What? Yeah, <laughs> everyone's shaking and nodding their heads. Yes, that's pretty good. And you get to help someone else out and they get the benefit. Um, I think that's really admirable, admirable um, AJ. So yeah, win-win Tara, exactly. Um, almost a triple win on that one. <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Um, okay, but I'm going to ask you two more questions, and then we're going to close out so that we can we can get into it next week. Um, what has been your biggest mistake or your biggest lesson? Oh man, so many to choose from. So many to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very humble of you to say. So that's <laughs> very good. Um. Not specific to this deal because we haven't had any missteps with cash offer, but previously when I was doing joint ventures, um, leaving things loose in terms of who's doing what, I had, I've lost a couple of partners and a couple of friends over things souring, over 
not having clear expectations around how long we were going to be doing this for, whose job it was to do certain things, and how we were going to distribute capital and all the different things you need to determine when you put together a joint venture agreement. And we were doing all these deals on a handshake. I didn't even really use the JV agreement in most of my early joint ventures. And so I would say the biggest mistake I had was not going into those things with the worst case scenario in mind and not thinking through all the things that could go wrong. And that's just a lesson that I think a lot of people have to learn the hard way. And so now it's just about expectations. It's about making sure that everyone is reading from the literal same page. That's an actual page that people have signed. And then you create a whole lot less confusion. You know, and I really appreciate that because, you know, it's easy to get so excited about, you know, a deal or a business opportunity and just get right into it and, okay, well, we'll figure it out on the fly. And even though you've got the best intentions or whatever have you, it's really important. And one something that I really, I like to pride myself on, although I've made the same mistake, AJ, is I do like to go slow to go fast. There's no, there's no, there's always going to be another deal. There's always going to be another opportunity. Slow that train down, get it all sorted out. I love that. So that's a really big lesson um, for all of us, I think, um, in the real estate world and in business and just in life in general. It's making, I see a lot of heads nodding. So well done, AJ. That, that was some very good lessons. And then I guess I would say, you know, on the, on the flip side, what has been your biggest opportunity that you've been able to really like just latch onto and roll with in life? Biggest opportunity came your way. Oh boy. Um, I think my foray into real estate development, um, I, I found a, an acreage property that could be developed. In fact, the property was owned by the family of one of my best friends. And she said, Hey, I think my family might sell this property. And I knew it had development potential and I was way out of my depth, but it's one of those things where I just jumped out of the par- out of the plane and built the parachute on the way down and surrounded myself with smarter people than me and found civil engineers and found architects. And, um, you know, we had, it was a pretty aggressive project for a 25 year old kid to go in there and, you know, put a, put a road in where a farm pasture used to be and build 13 homes and all the stuff that we did, the infrastructure that required to do that and getting it through the city and, and all that. So that was, and that was about a five year project, but that provided the capital to do a lot of what I've been doing for the last little while. So that opportunity was very much like a springboard opportunity for me. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. So not only did you get to experience of like a large project, the zoning, the construction, the development, development is a big deal. <laughs> Like you said, even for friends, especially for a 25 year old, but then that also created sort of some experiential bandwidth or knowledge and whatnot, and then in, and again, skill and whatnot, and then being able to also, yeah, help provide capital for some of your new future ventures in real estate. For sure. Awesome. There's a couple of questions on here that I do kind of want to answer, specifically the one about cash flow with the credit. A lot of people get hung up on that too. And so that's a, uh, the question was, if you're giving them credit for their monthly payment, for a portion of their monthly payment, does that affect your cash flow calculation? Well, I can see why you'd think that, but the reality of it is cash flow is the money that you receive on a monthly basis. You cash those checks. There's the only circumstance where that money goes back is when they close. And that money is accounted for based on let's say for the example I gave that thousand dollars a month, our mortgage is being reduced in a situation like that, probably by about 1700 or $1,800 a month. And so we're actually paying the home off faster than them. And so the cash flow is long gone. If they don't close, they don't get it back. If they do close, it's credited against the purchase price and it's offset by the mortgage pay down that we have. And then in, in other words, if I can, so if I understand that in a different way is that, the the um yeah so the credit that the tenant is paying in sort of a premium rental premium you're not taking that as into your a, a separate account and putting it into a savings account you're applying it to the mortgage and therefore you're getting a premium no, on sorry, your equity no no no, no okay. we're we're taking that money into general revenue because that's the revenue that's coming off of it it's an accounting thing at the end where they made 24 monthly payments they have a twenty four thousand dollar credit against the final purchase price but our mortgage balance at the beginning is now well beyond $24,000 reduced. So from a cash flow perspective, it doesn't come into play and it doesn't factor into our overall return. It's, it was calculated in advance. It's taken into consideration when I say it brings in 26%. Those two things have been calibrated against each other. Okay. 
Awesome. Thank you. Um, actually, could you answer Elias's question about how does eviction work for RTO? Do you need to deal with the LTB? Now, you're not in Ontario for this, but it will British be. Columbia has, yeah. yeah. So LTB is the tenancy branch, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. yeah, it's the same. So you have to deal with them, which is a lot easier than foreclosing. Still a pain in the butt, but it's a lot easier than foreclosing. And for those of you who are wondering specifically about Ontario LTB right now, what's going on, please check out the rural newsletter, the intelligence newsletter that was sent out today. There's an article in there and, oh my God, oops, shouldn't say that so loud. <laughs> so I forgot for long. <laughs> so, oh my goodness, um, um, what's going on out there in terms of the delays and the, and the, and uh, anyway, just read the article. I'm going to stop talking right there before I get myself into hot water. It's, uh, it's important to understand the resources behind the LTB or various tenancy boards. And um, Ontario is actually, they're just, uh, they're just changing their model to part-time employees significantly instead of full-time employees. So some of those delays are going to be even longer. Sorry. All right. Um, so everyone, uh, so AJ, thank you so much. Can um, I answer Duncan's you've, last you've question? You've got one more, yeah. So he asked me if we evict the RTO, do they lose their deposit? So the way that rent-owned contracts are structured, yes. The way we do it in practice, especially in a market where we stand to benefit if we get the house back and we can sell it for more than we agreed to pay, uh, they get agreed to sell it to them for, then what we do is we say, hey, stay in the house, keep it looking nice, and we'll sell it, cooperate with the showings, and when it sells, we'll give you back your deposit. We're pretty, we don't have to do that. You know what I mean? I would get a slightly better return for my investors if I didn't, but I don't want the negative PR and I don't want anybody leaving with a negative taste. If we're going to do better on the property than we had intended, I have no issue giving them back their 30 grand. Yeah. And Duncan and Leanne, like that's exactly good man. Cheers. And this is how in our community at the Real Estate Wealth Lab, this is how we do business. These are the types of individuals that we align ourselves with. We, um, if the, when you create enough wealth and you create enough returns on investment, you, there's, there should be no squabbling over small amounts like this is a this is an abundance mentality it's a place where we can do good business with good people and and everybody can win i truly believe in win-win so I, I appreciate that aj you bet awesome okay well thank you so much for your time we have gone a little over time but uh next week plan for about 90 minutes and uh so aj is going to go through about a little presentation about half an hour ish um, so you can, again, wear it from your do-it-yourself hat or your don't-do-it-yourself hat. Either way, the choice is yours, and uh, or both even. Um, maybe you want to set this up in elsewhere and get some other your RSPs. You can't invest your RSPs in yourself and your own deals, so that could be something. Your, your, your uh, I shouldn't say RSPs. I hate that word. Your, um, your registered funds, whatever format they happen to be in, Lira, TFSAs, RSPs, the whole gamut. So you could do that. So it could be from both hats. Regardless, come out next week and um, we will get into it even more and have your questions uh, ready. So thank you again, AJ. Thank My you pleasure. everyone out there and on uh, in the in the land of LinkedIn and whatnot. You're done. Cheers awesome. success, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Have a good night.